So you were saying earlier uh, when we were, you know, we we're just getting getting together. Before we get started with all this, you you were saying that your your work was super busy, right? Yep. And you were just wrap. You were just trying to. You, so do you have? Does, does your work end up being uh, like a twenty four seven type of gig when when it's the year end and you're chasing bad guys, or how does that work? Well, yeah, being uh, involved in financial crime prevention in a large financial institution, especially a global one. Uh, what makes it most difficult or challenging is that th there are people in Asia, Europe, and both coasts of the US. So the time zone thing gets very challenging. Right, right. So if you want to start dealing with people in Sydney on a Tuesday, and uh, I don't even want to do the uh, time zone math <laughs> to get a, a meeting where everyone can yeah. attend. Yeah. And ordinarily, these things, uh, I think what drives a lot of these things is people make commitments to regulators and other types on in terms of when they're going to be done fixing things and it's almost always the end of the year right so right that kind of is a rush for that yeah so and then there's catching the bad guys <laughs> <laughs> and so what so do you then report that to uh, to the fbi or who does that go to or is it international or are you just yeah. you just put sanctions from your corporation on on the entities you're dealing with the, the way that works is um, companies, financial institutions agree to abide by certain guidelines in terms of the type of people and companies you'll do business with. Right. And they're risk rated, et cetera. But if you come in and say, yes, I'm an all cash business in a very high risk uh, location doing, and I'm an arms dealer, which is a, a legal business, mm -hmm. but the odds are pretty get good. A big bank is going to think three times before taking on that kind of business. Um, but if we, you know, and the, the core activity is making sure that when we take people on, we really, really know that it's not some shell or, or, um, other kind of cover for illegal payments right. or money laundering, and then keeping an eye on how things go. So if, uh, uh, Kevin Sharp incorporated typically transacts $30,000 a month in and out, and then one month there's $20 million moving in and out every week. That's, that which is a very simple example that should be caught by somebody right. that'll get investigated typically by the financial institution itself and they'll say hmm yeah this doesn't look kosher in any way shape or form we're referring it to our um sort of financial investigations unit and that's typically the network of um law enforcement and investigations in institutions and law enforcement um entities globally so it'll get referred to here in the u.s something called fincen the financial uh crime enforcement network and they'll right. figure out oh no he's got accounts in france let's get a hold of interpol he's got accounts in you know russia let's get the fsb and whoever else has to be involved so it, our job is basically preventing people who might be problematic from even getting accounts right but and then keeping an eye on the activity of accounts on a risk rate basis to make sure um we can spot when things are getting funky and then reporting it so you're the jack you're the jack ryan of your bank yes i'm the analyst who winds <laughs> up on a helicopter with an m50 <laughs> that's me i'm pushing paper next minute I'm, uh, I'm i'm on a jet and a helicopter and i've got an m60 or something right that's right that's, that's right. right that's, that's me right. well all right man you're a badass that's awesome right. what can i say Right. Well, so so what I what I like to do when we do these conversations, I I call them designer deep dives, and mm -hmm. you're a first time designer, yes, that's right, right, yep, and a long time war gamer. Mean, you have played all of it a lot, yep. So lifetimes of experience, and you've played with a lot of great gamers and great designers, and been around the whole nexus of. Uh, New York and SBI and Avalon Hill and Herman and Berg and all those yahoos, right? All those uh, yep. fellows. Yep. And so uh, these designer deep dives, all what I like to do rather than do the traditional, hey, what was your first war game, uh, mm -hmm. is get into how you came up with your idea. Mm -hmm. And I know that your idea is, is built on a, another system and you've spoken to the designer and all that sort of stuff, but um, <clears throat> how, 
how, how you come up with your idea, what was the catalyst for it, and then walk through the different stages. So all the way from ideation to, now you haven't published it yet, but you know what, what do you see it being when you're done and what do you hope to achieve with it and what are the goals of the design? And so, so we'll just have a, a conversation and we might bounce around a little bit, but uh, we'll just have a, a general discussion about your your thoughts on the design, what it's meant to mm-hmm. do and what it's meant to explore and show and then we'll see where that takes us, if that's cool with you. Perfect, sure, ready to go. All right, Mike, so so first up, right? So what, what is the name of the game that you're, you're currently designing? It's called Prelude to Revolution, Russia's Descent into Anarchy, 1905 to 1917. So a uh, a a challenge, probably a challenging topic anyway, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, so, tell me a little bit about what the what the interest is in that area. Sure. So, if you think about the Russian Revolution, if one was thinking about the Russian Revolution, um, most people would say, start thinking about the year nineteen seventeen. But there was a decade and change of steady slow decline where um, the reforming and revolutionary impulses of the population, which had been going on for a while, came into direct uh, conflict with the the czar and the government. And the, the way I characterize it is on both sides, there was on one hand a desire to somehow figure out how to keep the enough of the good of the status quo going while reforming or getting rid of what was causing uh, all the upheaval. And at the same time, both sides had extremist tendencies uh, where the desire to either just burn the whole thing down and start again on one side or just clamp down with complete repression and um, exert autocratic authority on the other side was at play. So you have moderate reformers who were willing to try and work together and improve things versus the extremists who really just wanted to um, take extreme uh, action. Yes. So that starts in 19, with the crack is in 1905 after the, the uh, Russo-Japanese War, and the defeat of Russia by this, yeah, this right. tiny this tiny Asian country, which was poorly regarded and, you know, to be pushed around, but no, it had defeated the biggest country in the world. Right. And, and now was grabbing land and humiliating and so on. The czar was, was so weakened that he was forced to at least allow a form of parliament to be formed, the Duma. And that start, that's a long downhill sl- slide starts from there. Right. So, so what's fascinating is watching these two tendencies. Like, let's try and fix it and keep it going. To let's burn it down or or clamp it down, compete with each other, and both sides are at the mercy of events and and forces that are completely out of their control that that drive the priorities, like World War One, um, that completely drive the priorities and take the matters out of the hands of the people who are trying to run things. So. If I translate this into game terms, is we have a game where things start off at relative parity. Both sides have priorities, but both sides have extremist tendencies that have to be balanced or controlled. And as it proceeds, things happen which reprioritize things for the for the participants. World War One started. We really can't be sitting here debating whether or not land should be redistributed to peasants today because all those peasants got to go to the army now right and we got to just stop all this and and or and that's just one example of how events take over and push things and then finally it's a downhill slide till essentially the country completely fell apart and it's you watch a modern nation which was virtually ungoverned undefended in total chaos that's why descent into anarchy in 1917 and the result of that and i think the game seeks to show exactly that what what the driving um the driving experience of the game should be players trying to balance their moderate and extremist tendencies of their factions 
So for the Russians, for example, you have the socialists who are kind of, you know, want to just keep things moving, but in proven reform versus the Bolsheviks who just want to burn the whole thing down right. and start a world revolution. Right. right. The other player, say the government, has a liberal faction who's saying, yeah, you know, maybe we should loosen up a bit and have a prime minister and push the czar to give us a constitution and stuff like that. And the monarchists who are saying, nope, autocracy or nothing. So both sides had to balance those things. And then as time progresses through the game, what I'm trying to portray is there's ups and downs on the um, fortunes of both aspects of the play of that the, the players factions okay. and then as you progress things slide 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 and as you hit the last part of the game there's you you kind of start losing control of events and uh effects and something dramatic happens to end the game right. or the game might reach conclusion before right that. so so how the now I, I guess it would be fair for us to for potential players to try and understand the genesis with the pre, that's prelude to rebellion is isn't that what mm -hmm. is? yeah yeah so yes. tell me a little bit of, so you obviously a fan of that game oh yeah yeah so can you and i'm not familiar with it very much so, it, so can you tell us a, give me a, a high level maybe just you know a couple of minutes high level of sure. what that game is i'm assuming it's a cdg area area movement uh is it area movement, area movement or point no point. no no, neither. Neither. Okay. Enough. See, so I don't know. So tell me. <laughs> so, so think about uh, if you're thinking of areas, think in terms of Twilight Struggle, which I think is the great granddaddy of all this stuff. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, Prelude to Rebellion takes the idea of an area that you contest for control over, right? And in Twilight, you put influence points in there. In Prelude, instead, you have these two tracks. One for oh, the each right. player, right? Yeah, and you put the, Q. It's, it's the green and red uh, tracks yeah, on the exactly. uh, That's what I remember that now. Okay, go. And this, uh, there's all kinds of qualifiers and modifiers as to how much it costs you to put things into tracks and when you can put things into tracks and what benefits you get from doing so. But that's the essential. So there's 24 areas on the board in Prelude to Rebellion that represent the 24 electoral districts in Lower Canada in 1834. Mm -hmm. And the idea, some are the rural farm French Canadian farmers who are kicking up a fuss and some of the even the English farmers who are kicking up a fuss about, you know, this colonial government that just basically is a bunch of elitists taking all the good stuff for themselves. And the other side is the colonial government that is, in fact, taking all, all the good, good stuff, stuff for themselves. For themselves. Right, right. So the districts tend to be biased towards one or the other. And um, there's a there's a central Quebec and Montreal where the government sits. So that represents sort of the core of the uh, government. And the game revolves around cards. Yes, this is a CDG. Very, very much a Twilight uh, mechanic in many ways where you play a card, you can do the event or the op points. Right. Uh, you can do your opponent's card, but then they get to do the event. So some uh, unique... In things that they introduce, which are interesting, there's an opportunity pool. So at the beginning of the game, you take out cards and put them out face up, more or less, and you can buy those out. So everybody sees them there. And some are for me, some are for you, some are neutral, but I can see which ones you might get to play and so on and so forth. Um, and also there are key events, which are not things that have to happen, but they go into that opportunity pool and you can trigger them. So there's some key event with a, a vote or an election. You which will yield victory points. You can make it happen, you don't have to. So the card play is quite interesting in that respect. The cube play creates um, a lot of options, that, and, the, and the fact that some of the cubes go into r rural districts, which are the farmers and, and field hands, and the other goes into uh, the government districts, Montreal, Quebec, creates sort of, you have to balance those things. Right. The, there's a ticking clock in the background called Rebellious Spirit, and it's a track on the side of the board that ticks up unless controlled every turn. And when it hits the top, game over. People, the extremist side of the farmers and workmen just finally lost patience and staged a rebellion. Right. Interesting. Okay. You do a scoring yeah. round and end. Yeah. It's sort of like Def, almost like DEF CON in um, Twilight. Right, right. A lot of unique and interesting mechanics and all interwoven. You have the ticking clock. The scoring mechanisms are completely unique. You 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 roll a die after each card play that advances the possibility of one of the scoring tracks triggering. So everybody sees like the the scoring progress. Um, and all of this works together to place uh, 
to place the player in a, con- a situation where they see how the scoring is going. It's not hidden. It's not like a scoring card comes out. You can see when, say, the rural districts, which are usually good for the farmers or the patriots, they call them, is going to score and you could do something about it. Um, you have the opportunity pool. You can say, oh, no, he's going to be able to play that event. I better defend it or I better buy this neutral event to right. neutralize it. Right. And then there's the ticking clock. And a bunch of other stuff. So it's a great, great, great system, and it's a lot of fun to play. The one of the problems is, first, Kevin, tell me what you know about the rebellion in Lower Canada in 1838. Yeah, exactly, no, nothing. Right. I sat in our club in New York, Metropolitan War Gamers, and about 25 people trailed in that day, and I asked every single one of them that same question. Even the guys I play who are from Canada didn't know about it, right. unless you were brought up in Quebec, or maybe one guy from Buffalo knew. You know, isn't that yeah. the one with the farmers? Or so it's a topic nobody really knows, yeah, yeah. and it's not by. I mean, Marco's a great designer; he's done an immaculate job with the game. But who knew him? Nobody knows the designer. Nobody knows the right. the topic and, very well. And was that Compass Games? Compass Games published it. Yeah, Compass. You got to bless Compass. They they're they're willing yeah. to take a crack at these yeah. things. That they, they they did a, a beautiful for this too, uh, if I recall. Did they? Yeah. I. I I didn't follow it then. In fact, I ignored it completely. Mm-hmm. Even at last year's Compass Game Expo, I saw it and said, eh, I'd never heard of that. <laughs> you know? And yet, uh, when John Krantz asked me to do a review on it and have a look at it, um, that's when I got acquainted with the game. Right. And I obviously became glad. a fan, right? So much so that you want I, to use the, So you're now using the new system, using that system or something yep. akin to it for for this uh, title for the Descent into Anarchy. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so talk, re- about, talk about that and how, how that ties sure. together. So the ideation part of it, the initial ideation, so we'll call it the Prelude system. So we're, I'm playing Prelude to Rebellion. And if I may pause for a second, Compass Games are, um, I think they're really in this for the long game. I have a lot of respect for that company because mm-hmm. they're already thinking of they immediately recognized this is a material for a series of games. They, this, this game needs sequels. That was the first thing they said, and they were thinking about doing more. Um, they were, actually had teed up American Revolution before I just showed up out of nowhere and said, I'm going to do Russian Revolution. But uh, <laughs> So the way the whole process started, I'm not a game designer, and I don't have a tremendous amount of time to devote to game design, but I played the game, and after the first playing, I said, oh my goodness, the way this thing ebbs and flows, you have so many competing priorities. You have the ticking clock of the rebellious spirit just driving towards this cataclysmic game-ending scoring event. And all this other stuff just really would be a great game for the Russian Revolution. Just it popped into my head. or well, that was the inspiration. Yes. And that's why um, I thought, okay, that's an interesting thought. Went on with the game, forgot it for a while. But then... Um, somehow or other became inspired and said, okay, but what would that really look like? And here's where I have to thank uh, Dave Doctor, oh, yeah. who, uh, who uh, designed K- uh, Triumph of Chaos, one of my one of the, the other inspiration games for this. Um, one of the things I love about that game is Triumph of Chaos is it does exactly that. It, sh- it really introduces the anarchy, the unpredictability, the inability to 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 um plan solidly but the need to have a solid plan you got to be trying to do something but you got to be ready for anything to happen um the card play being very varied in all kinds of uh, different mini card games involved um i i started thinking about the game i got in touch with marco and he thought it was an excellent idea marco is a great guy brilliant designer um and i think in professionally he's a qa engineer of some sort which mm-hmm. means he's detail yeah, oriented yeah, and yeah, sure. you know wants to get stuff right um and he gave me some initial thoughts and said why don't you you know read a book and uh, make notes of events you think would be useful and so on and so forth but dave doctor was extremely helpful because believe it or not when you sit down to design a game one of the first difficult things to say is who are the players Right, who you're playing, right, right, and a right. lot of different, you know, the the tendency is to want to say, well, uh, you be Lenin and I'll be the Tsar. But unfortunately, Lenin really wasn't involved in the Russian Revolution very much until the middle of 1917. 
directly. Yes. I mean, he was an inspiration and a thinker, but he wasn't there at all, or hardly at all. Um, so you couldn't be personality based and who were the players going to be and therefore what are your goals and all of that kind of thinking started to occur to me. So one at weekend, I sat down with PowerPoint and mocked up a board, mocked up a bunch of cards and brought it down to the club, printed it out and brought it down to the club and got some people who had played the base game, the prelude system to give it a try. And everybody was like, yeah, that was kind of fun. Hmm. And that, that got me to the point where I said, okay, I, I have this something. underlying yeah, the system works. Right. And as long as I don't overburden it or over tinker, as we you know, coined the, the phrase we coined earlier, as long as we don't over tinker with it, I could probably make a real life game out of this. And that's the way the process started. That's what gave me the, the confidence to go ahead and say, yeah, I could probably do this. Uh, speaking to Marco, speaking to other people who said, yeah, I'll play test, yeah, I'll help, and so on and so forth, encouraged me along. Um, so you built a prototype, uh, based probably, you, so you took the base prelude rules then, because the, that general system would work, the the cube, cube management, hand management yep. side of things would all work just fine, and then yep. the, probably the biggest part of all this then is the historical research and the events that, that occur from 1905 through 1917, and that kind of building to that crescendo of of drama really right so yeah so how what books did you use and what are the events going to be well what books did you use let's start there okay a lot but i i will dedicate this game to and rely mostly on a book by uh professor richard pipes a late unfortunately professor richard pipes called the russian revolution okay he wrote a number of books on the topic men's was brilliant and one of, if you want to read a book, one of the very few books I've ever read that made sense out of the Russian Civil War, which is the aftermath, as you, I think, you know, takes place, say, from 1918 to 1921 or so, the most confusing series of events and most almost in difficult, impossible to follow, um, he makes perfect sense out of it. It's mm -hmm. amazing. So I really, really, really enjoyed the book. It lays things out understandably great historical context and they then great information about the events themselves so that's the sort of uh, research base interestingly enough there's a um a couple of things that i felt were necessary to incorporate into the the research and basis of the game which is one make sure i was remaining true to the prelude system um it's patterned after twilight struggle and that there's three eras and, and, and Twilight, I think, is early, middle, late war. In Rebellion, it's a couple of different sets of years. Right. I've got, in in Prelude to Revolution, I've got the Years of Turmoil, which is about 1905 to 1913, the Great War, which is 14 to 16, and then the Collapse, which is 1917. And the three turns in there are February, July, and October. So... The challenge there is, you know, get each one to have its own character, as you say, and that was um, a priority. And what's going on in each of those? What is the player playing for? Right. Um, and uh, getting it to and designing in that crescendo, as you put it. So um, making it so that the play one. Sorry, to to state again, it's easy to take the game state and just throw it up in the air and totally ob obliterate it and make it into a totally chaotic situation. You won't get many people who want to play it more than once because if I'm a player and I'd like to win maybe, and I've spent some time and energy figuring out the right cards to play and the right way to approach. And I just hit a trigger in the game where none of that matters. It all just gets blown up. That's no fun. So you can't have a, um, so as the game progresses towards that point of collapse, you can't make the collapse be so complete that the players don't matter anymore and they're just along for the ride. Right. Some might enjoy that, but you've got to design it so their smart play and their preparation and their strategy and approach to the collapse matters. 
So even though there's that, chaos, there's mitigation strategies that you can deploy based on the cards you, have you to, might have if you have the right cards at the right time and things of that nature. Right. right. So that's the big. That's one big challenge. Um, yeah. So getting the history into it actually is has not been for the first two parts. That is during the run up to the Great War and the Great War itself has been relatively straightforward. Marco has designed an incredibly functional set of cards, just like Twilight Struggle did, and you see in Coin as well. You see the same thematic cards. If you just covered the picture, covered the text, you know, and just looked at what you do, you'll probably find in every Coin game, there's forty percent of the cards are identical or virtually identical. Put a cube, take a cube, yeah. Yeah. Right. like that. So that part was relatively easy, and then saying, okay, well, what historical event or what circumstance might be um, descriptive of this is one thing. Then there's the part of saying, okay, well, um, one thing that was a big deal is they used to punish peasants by shaving their heads and beards and sending them off to the army. That was a czarist punishment. So what would that look like in game terms? Okay, so we'll take some cubes out of these districts and put them in those districts and modeling, trying to model mm -hmm. what you knew were historical events of interest and having and model them in game terms so that's the second challenge a third challenge believe it or not is figuring out what are the key events what things must be represented like in um you know you read uh, you'll play twilight for example and the certain events have to be in there you play i guess empire of the sun certain offensives or certain defensives are cards that might must get played or better yet for the people you get this card in your hand, you have to play it. Yes. Right? How many of we don't have any of those in the uh, prelude system. What we have is key events and, and I've added key personalities, which are in that pool. So they can get played. They're on they go in the pool. So for example, when the middle era, the Great War starts off and the key event card comes out, war. Boom, it's in there. You don't have to play it. Nobody has to play it actually. But there's advantages. It sets a game state which one or the other player may desire. But uh, that's so modeling. But how many of those do you really want to have? Twelve in a, in one era. That's way too many because there's like Twilight. There's eight rounds of card play per turn, and there's only two turns for the average era. The last one is three. So you can't have like so many of these things that they take over the game. Yes. But certain ones you got to make sure in there. So those are the kinds of challenges. So that's the subtlety. So go, go ahead, carry on. The only other thing I'll add is in Rebellion, the base game, there's a ticking clock called Rebellious Spirit. And that represents the farmers and workmen just losing their the extreme the extremists in the in the party, losing their patience and then deciding mm -hmm. to grab the pitchforks and torches and go storm the, the mansion and by the way the actual rebellion i think lasted two or three weeks and the result was everybody was it was crushed by the british regular garrison there and everybody who was involved was either hung exiled or jailed i mean it was <laughs> not a very, <laughs> very you know those those uh, wily records have a habit of doing that right yeah, I mean, I think it set a tone in the province, which lasts till today, but the rebellion mm -hmm. itself didn't really uh, oust the colonial government much at all. They were depending on help from the U.S. They figured we'd step in because we're so proud of our northern neighbors. Anyway, the ticking clock. So rather than the rebellious spirit, I have the Bolshevik coup. Because if you know the history, what happens is the Bolsheviks kind of play along a little bit with all of the other the revolutionaries mm -hmm. but all they want to do is throw the whole thing in the trash burn it down and start a world revolution yes so they're looking for the chance to just bash the whole thing yes and even after the czar abdicates and the government gets set up they're looking to undermine it get rid of it and put their own in so they could start the world revolution yes so that's a ticking clock that's the bolshevik coup track and that's ticking up all the time it can tick down enough but as it ticks up further and further all of a sudden, events are enabled, which get nastier and nastier, depending. And then when it hits the top, we have the Bolshevik coup event, Red October, where there's a, a round of scoring, which can be very unpredictable. But as you said before, if, you, if you're if you Lenin, you're probably playing cards and setting up things on the board so that when Red October occurs, you have the best chance of winning. Right. Similarly, there's another track called the Tsar's Prestige. Now, if the Tsar is poorly regarded and gets worse his influence slips if it gets very low maybe this the government can push him into 
granting a constitution. Maybe, maybe not. But if it gets too low, he's going to abdicate, in which case the whole game changes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we lose, okay. right? Yeah. And and But if it goes too high, so, but if it goes over the top, then the czar has got all the influence. And what I've decided at this point in design is the game ends in a draw because autocracy has been reimposed. So at some point, what's interesting here is the, that that track gets so high that both players don't want it to go over the top. So it forces coordination. Right, because you don't want a draw. You would prefer a win right. or, or, or a loss, right, as the case might be. Or you can be the player who's hopelessly behind who may be saying, screw this. I'm just going to drive up the Tsar's prestige track and force a draw. Yeah. I have had a game. In fact, when I showed the game to Ken uh, at Compass Games, who ultimately green-lighted it, um, we got to a point where we were playing where I was – I made, played a card which gave me a great advantage, but put that track right at the verge. And I said, okay, Ken, what are you going to do about it? Because next turn, it's going to tick up and we draw. What are you going to, you know? And he had to expend resources to start driving it back down again. So it's exactly what I want to see in the game, where yeah. the game creates circumstances which reprioritize and things for you. Well, I think, so I think that's interesting because one of the, one of the things that I've found with uh, more abstract titles is that, because of that level of abstraction, you if you you've got to find ways to engage your player, right? If they're not thinking about yeah. DRMs and column shifts and uh, you know tactical strategies or even grand strategies with units on a hex and counter board and all that sort of thing, how are you going to basically force t tough choices on them? Because that's what it, it's right. that's what it's about, right? So one of the things I found very successful with the, the Hollenspiel company, while they have a lot of games that are six to eight pages of rules, you sit down to play those games on a tiny map with 50 counters or whatever the case may be, or 50 cubes, and you've got a few cards or you've got some activities that are going on, every turn is just painful because if I do this, this mm -hmm. happens, but it helps, it helps my enemy. If I do that, it doesn't help me, but it also but it doesn't help my enemy. So you, you're faced with those tough choices. And so that's I, one of the things I've come to appreciate over time. It's kind of a long-winded way of saying that I'm beginning to appreciate abstraction and non-hex uh, encounter games and more CDG-based titles. I'm appreciating the decision-making matrices that are that are delivered to you as a as a consumer of the game, right? As the player. Yep. So, what, 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 so I'm going to probably change tack reasonably quickly here. One of the questions I had was um, in terms of timing, you've got those three stages of the game, but are, mm -hmm. there, um, are, are there different sets of cards for each era in the game? Yeah. Okay, so so uh, I can't get the Bolsh Bolshevik Revolution in 1907. It's definitely going to happen in some later period. So you're not getting that anti-historical or ahistorical sort of pop uh, or does that happen you could so it's the way it works is there's there's three decks one for each era and then there's mm -hmm. a stack of what the, are termed generic cards general, general, uh, general. general stack right yeah yeah every you know and your hand can starts off with four from the year specific one deck and three from the general deck gotcha and we and this way you the events and and so, stuff that are more likely to occur in the turmoil years of turmoil predominate your deck. Now the way the ticking clocks work, the 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 Bolshevik coup track, for example, that could potentially happen at any point. They could try it at any point, but of course it does tend to tick up, and then there are events you play where um, you know you get some advantage, but it ticks it up, and you could keep it can keep moving up a tick at a time um, all through the game. There's ways to freeze it in place, and sometimes there's even ways to reduce it. But more typically, it's driving up every turn. The question is how quickly and under how much control do you want to place it? So if you're the, the revolutionary player, you may say, no, 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 we're not having a Bolshevik coup today, so I'm just going to pay a few action points to freeze that in place this round, right. and it's going to stay frozen this turn. Right. Right. Okay. So it doesn't advance, and it can't be advanced. Uh, 
Whereas you might at the end, if you're at during the last part of the game, if Len, when Lennon comes into play, who probably his key ability is going to be able to beat a trade off victory or opportunity points to drive up that track. He may say, okay, I got it all set up. I've got the soldier Soviets ready to deploy his red guards. I've got the worker Soviets ready to go on general strike. I've got this, I've got that. I'm ready to trigger this coup because I think I can win it. And that, yep. All right. Okay. So sorry, you were saying. Yeah. It's entirely possible that events can occur out of historical order. That's possible. Um, But for example, the war will only be a possibility during that middle era. Doesn't mean you have to play it, but it 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 becomes an option in that era. So the historicality is, yeah, that you can decide to trigger it. The player option is, but it's not to my advantage, so I'm not gonna. Similarly, with the Bolshevik coup, if you really think you're ready for it and you might win it, or then go ahead and see if you can drive that track up. And get it over the top to end the game. Gotcha. gotcha. So, similarly, if you think you're well positioned to take advantage of uh, the the game situation after the czar abdicates, go ahead and drive his prestige down and get him to abdicate. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. So now, when you, when you so from a play uh, a play balance and play cadence perspective, mm-hmm. you've got the system, the, the core system there that's really helping you drive the gameplay and helps you then it's just a a matter of balancing and and making things mechanically work mechanically and have the right events situated Mm -hmm. so that it all sort of comes together you know can easier sort of blow through the three eras when when i'm interacting with the game i'm using you're going to obviously have a map board and a similar sort of tracks Mm -hmm. i imagine Mm -hmm. yep and so we will you uh one of the things I didn't like about the game was the the, the color schemes uh, for the um, for the prior title, right? I, it just it it the game uh, aesthetically was unattractive to me. It wasn't yeah. interesting. So I'm curious about your thinking around. You know, you've got a great theme, all right, and mm-hmm. you you know, lots of. Uh, uh, art that can be applied to that so how what's your thinking around how you want that to look and feel are you handing that off to a an artist to do or do you have you know concrete thoughts around it tell me a little bit more about that side of the design right because that's a critical part right our our physical physical interaction with the with the unit with the units with the components and the cards and the map matter yes absolutely so i'm not a graphic artist clearly But I had a pretty clear idea uh, that, as you say, the look and feel of the game, the the component, the components themselves are going to drive a lot of the player's experience. Um, I, like you, have been gaming for a while, and frankly, one of the reasons I love the games is because I get to hover over a map and pick up the chits and Mm -hmm. roll the dice and fiddle with the stuff, and that's that's just part of it. That's got to be pleasing. So what was the thinking? Yes, so I did put together a prototype map. And um, what I thought about was first, it's a map of Russia divided up into areas and each area has a track in it. And I thought about it for a while and talked about it with one of my design partners or sounding boards. And he said, uh, really, you know, why the whole country? Isn't it mostly around Moscow and Petersburg? And that triggered the thought, in fact, for the main events of the revolution, most of them happened in Petersburg. Hmm. Mm-hmm. They really, most of the nation, in fact, was oblivious to the fact that the revolution had taken place until like 1918. Right, right. So I went and found a period street map of Petersburg and superimposed on that the various districts. And the, since the districts are standalone, it does. there's no moving from one to another. There's no adjacency involved. I just named them appropriately. and. S- it, I think it's the right way to go because it's ultimately superimposed on a street map. The names of the areas are roughly where they're located in the city. And in the center, there's the Duma, which is the parliament, which is, I think, the innovative part of the game, very uh, whole innovation into the system. And that sits right in the middle and everything is kind of around that. So that's the graphic quality. That, that's the graphic appearance that I think has um, 
taken hold in my mind. There's the mechanics of the board, meaning there are tracks on the right. There's the the Bolshevik coup and Tsar's prestige on the left, the victory points and, and the turn track across the bottom. That's kind of been set in the first base game. And I think that would be fine. But I do believe that the appearance of the board should have a very period and very Russian feel. Yeah. Now, to answer your second part of your question is, yes, ultimately, Compass will engage an artist and they will graphically design the game i'm I'm i don't recall exactly the terms of the agreement but i guess i'll get input but that would my input would be you got to get that feel it's got to be about russia it's got to be about the imperial city yes yes okay so So, yeah interesting okay well that's cool that's cool to know uh and, and that's um so when you're looking at the play test results so you've gone yeah. you've gone to we've we've come up with the idea we've got a prototype done and you've played it solo yourself and now you've played it with a few people have you handed off and had uh, individuals play it against each other or have you always coached and guided yeah so that's an interesting question it's just and so since we're talking about the design process the first part of it was okay let me just knock together cards and board and do what I think might work. And the process was which of the cards in the base game should just be, like I pointed out before, just lifted wholesale into the uh, right. new game right. and which ones are going to have to be unique. I tried to stick with the basic configuration of the deck. I think, for example, in, in, the, in Rebellion, the first part of the game, the first era, has 24 unique cards. So I kept it at 24. And the cards have costs like six, four, and two action points. So I kept the ratios the same. So I figured the deck more or less sticking to that structure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So that was a good guide. So I could work within those guides. It probably got me through it a lot quicker. After putting that together, playing it myself, working with uh, my friend and design partner, Mike Lorino, at the club, we played it together a number of times. And he had played the base game. We just kept playing it, kicking things around, changing things. That was the first phase. Just get something in place. Uh, That's when even the most basic mechanics were up to up for grabs. Should we have one track or two? Should it go up or down? Does this even make sense? Um, The whole question of how does the Duma, which is the Parliament, work, and how do you keep that from being just another set of tracks, but without becoming the overwhelming, you know, focus of the game? And what do you put in there? What do you not put in there? So we talked about a lot of that. We got to a relatively stable point, and then, um, and that took, I'll say, three to six months of pretty on and off, but steady po- poking away. At this point, however, we we did get um, after after introducing the game uh, in uh, November at the Compass Expo to Ken and Bill and the guys at Compass, and they immediately, Ken sat down and played it one night and said, this is great, let's do it. But then we started, he started bringing over people he knew and we just wound up playing me, guiding them through. And the process is the trick of the trade with a card game is you get card sleeves and regular like old magic or whatever cards Mm -hmm. and you just print out let's say powerpoint of your cards cut them out and put them in so that you have something which you can use you're holding a card but if you said mike this doesn't make sense why would i go up one on the bolshevik coup track here and i say you're right i could take the card make a notation on it during the play test and we continue so that worked well so that was the first time I actually had people besides myself playing. And what I started seeing is what I see when people are playing like Twilight and another game called Europe in Turmoil. Shout out to that game. Excellent. I think a great development of the uh, Twilight system and another inspiration in this game and the rebellion system. Um, I see that look when people are like looking at their cards and looking at the board and scratching their chins. And as soon as I saw that, I said, it's working. People are figuring out what's my best card play. How do I get this? How do I stop that? So since then, frankly, I haven't played it much myself. It's been people. Luckily, I have the Wargaming Club, the Metropolitan Wargamers, where I can get two or four people to sit down, play, criticize, play some more, have a design brainstorm. Um, And 
this has been going on very steadily for the last month and a half. And at this point, frankly, we're the last several playthroughs, and I have the first and second era designed both in cards and mechanics. It's played through. We've gotten different results. We've got different people ending well ahead. Uh, still cards are getting tweaked a bit. Some mechanics are getting corrected. But I think the fundamental flow of the game works at this point. And it is unassisted by me. I, I answer questions if somebody sure. said, what do you sure. mean by this? Fantastic. But people can so, play. so that's interesting to me. There's a... What if I look at some, some of these card-driven games, and uh, particularly you know Twilight Struggle, uh, some of the coin games, you, you, if you lay all the cards out and you look at, how, you, you mentioned earlier on, say, oh, well, look, how many of these are, you know, uh, place, a, place a cube, take a cube, and what, what percentage of them are, are, are that type of card, regardless of what the event is, uh, and, and what ops are they attached to? And how many of those three ops versus two ops versus one ops? Yeah, there's a there's a uh, a blend. There's a there's a not a formula per se, but there's a there's an optimal mix. And getting to that optimal mix, I think, probably comes from experience. But it's the the it's the play testing and having others play. That's why I was asking the question. Is you know because if you you're playing you know what the immediate first action needs to be on a certain certain gameplay. And I, I had this yep. experience with a, another person who was trying to develop a game, and they said, oh, you got to do this the first turn. So, well, yeah. Uh, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so well, the, the, these are the cards you start with, and you, you got to play this card here. Well, okay, well, no, yeah. I'm, well, I'm not doing that, so I'm going to go do this, right? Well, and yeah. that kind of didn't break the game but it changed the the history and so i think there's a wonderful and you know probably mark simonis does a good job of this too i think with his his some of his games is uh, uh with his new some of his new titles that there's this this mix of three up versus two up uh and then do i want the three up or do i want that event right is that event mm -hmm. that's a really critical event so yeah it's interesting that you've you're you're getting that balance, but also getting the feedback that's giving you the adjustments, right? It's not just you saying, I'm going to tweak this. Right. Well, the, the key to the exercise is Marco has done such a good job, at least in my opinion, on the some of the fundamentals of the cards mm -hmm. um, in terms of how many, what cost, and what kinds of effects. But you're right. There's, there's, um, there's a blend, frankly, uh, I've not sat down and done analysis like probably could and say, okay, how many two-point cards move or remove more than X number of cubes? And right. wait a second, here's an outlier that does too many or too few. More than I think the better feedback is this. And this is what I've been learning, I think, as d helping uh, to tweak and refine a deck of cards. You and I pl play the game. <clears throat> the cards come out. And as soon as we play a card and say, whoa, that's kind of powerful for a two-point card. Yeah, right, let's take a look right. at that. Doesn't this seem to have an outsized effect? Then I can take a look. But typically, what you want to avoid is having cards that are ridiculously overpowered or underpowered because yeah. they'll either be useless or game killers. But more importantly, you want to be careful because sometimes the card's power is a result of smart play on the part of the player. They've got a board set up a certain way. They've got a combo. They played one, two. Now that's three and a punch. Yes. You don't want to take away the punch because they were smart about how they played. Yeah, that's that's so that's an interesting, that's a really interesting challenge to have to deal with because I, I, yeah. if you take that away, then it's it's generic, right? It doesn't really matter what card you play. Almost, right. right. right? Exactly. So now you've now you you're taking choice and determination away from the player, and you and and diminishing the 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 fun of the game and the the, the impact exactly. of their, their choices. So that's interesting insight. That's interesting. So to just push further on the point you just raised, which is very important, this is what Marco, um, as a designer, has imparted to me and I've taken to heart, is don't prevent a player, but rather incent a player. Mm. So you don't want... So a key event in the first... Uh, you know, key event in the second era during the Great War is the war, right? You don't have to play the war. 
But if you're the czarist player, it drives your prestige way up. You get a bunch of victory points, and several other nice things happen, though a few nasty things happen. But then it sets up a lot of other nasty stuff that's going to hurt you later on. So what do you do? Do you start the war very late? Yeah, but then you don't get many of the benefits. Do you not start it at all? If you go without it, you're probably better off. So you, you, you're you incented to really think about how the events fit into your strategy. So what do you incent the player with? Victory points, you know, hurting your opponent, controlling your opponent, some of those basic mm -hmm. card things that you do. Um, but I found that shutting down options for players, saying no during a, a, a playtest session. Could I do this? No. You've made a mistake as a designer when that's your response. The question is, yeah, what happens if you do that? You don't want to go wild, um, but you want to react. It's almost like being a referee or a dungeon master in a role-playing game. You don't want to shut players down when they want to try something odd. You want to guide, incent them towards the more interesting parts of your story. And if they decide to wander around, you know, if the uh, wizard is going to impart internal wisdom onto them is sitting at a table and they instead want to go uh, inspect the bathroom plumbing, you know, <laughs> that's what they want to do, then yeah, they yeah. will. Let go, right? but, yeah. but ultimately, if you have a player who's saying, how am I going to leverage all this to get the most points and win versus a player who's kind of wandering around and, you know, ignoring the obvious cues, the, the smarter player will win. That's, that's the other thing that... Um, not always, because it is a random cards and dice driven event game, but ultimately you want a game that rewards smart play. You want the smarter players to have the advantage. Not automatically win. You want dumb players like me. I'm a lousy player, but you want us to have a chance once in a while too. Right. But uh, it's, it's really incenting the behavior with victory points and other advantages that I found has worked well with the cards. And just being sensitive. To, and willing to change you you got to be willing to say gee this card was fun to design it's interesting it's one of my favorite events i'm taking it out because it just doesn't work or it doesn't work right i'm going to change it completely right more is not necessarily more right right no no it's a it's a pairing back one of the things ken uh likes at uh, compass about the, the rebellion game is the whole set of rules ultimately is eight or nine pages with pictures and play aids, and uh, and so that's got to be an objective for a game like this. You want someone to sit down and play. Yeah, fast, accessible, but rich in uh, commentary and decision making, and and obviously your play. Now, is it it's strictly a two player game? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Right. Right now it is. Um, the way it worked, there's a. Other possibilities. So let me just digress for uh, a minute and describe the central mechanic of the Duma. If I you imagine... Come, I wanted to come back to that, so that's, I'm glad you did. Go ahead. Imagine, you know, so each area on the board has two tracks, one for the revolutionary and one for the government. And there's more or fewer spots on the track, so you can get a certain amount of... only, only up to a certain amount of influence, and it costs more or less per cube placement so if it's a very revolutionary area the gov it's going to be more expensive for the government to place in there and cheaper for the revolutionary so you can reflect sort of political leanings either which way that's but the duma has four tracks each player has two one track for your moderates each and one track for your extremists so the the revolutionary has the socialists for the moderates but the bolsheviks for the extremists the government has the liberals for the moderates and the monarchists for the extremists. The way that works is you've got two tracks, and building up both tracks absent any other effects, the higher e more you have in each track, the more victory points sway you have in the Duma. Right? So when the Duma scores, if you've got both your parties built all the way to the top and you've got all this other stuff, you're going to get more points. Okay, but Part of the problem you, we create there is if your extremists are part of a scoring event without going into too much detail, you have to roll a die, which may wind up uh, an event called um, growing extremism, which will gradually take cubes out of your moderate party and move them into the extremist party. If you fill your extremist party up, you start losing cubes and points because you have no place to put the moderates. If your moderates are empty, 
when the if any of those parties is empty when you score, you lose more points to your opponent. So, yeah, you have this strong extremist faction, but having that means your moderates are going to either leave the Duma or drift into the extremist faction, and you wind up overbalancing your government and having bad things happen for that reason. There are events that cue to the fact if your extremist faction has more than X number of cubes, this bad thing happens to you. or this. So, yeah, you want to build it up and you want to get those benefits, but there's bad things happen too. But not too much of it, right? Or, or, right. or, or, or are you in a position to manage that? Yes, that yeah, yeah, you is. can manage it. Sure, right. you can avoid doing things that let your extremists grow. Right. Now, the other thing is... Um, with a nod to uh, 1989 Dawn of Freedom, which is one evolution of Twilight, and then the next, and I think best so far evolution of Twilight, which is Europe and Turmoil, each, in, in Europe and Turmoil, if I can describe it, each area, Twilight-like area, has also a attribute. It's an intellectual area, or government, or worker, or farmer, or something like that. And now there's a whole other layer of complexity under the game because the cards key off of that. If you have, if you control two worker districts in France, you can do this. Or during scoring, there's a pre-scoring round where you get to do, maneuver the scoring to your advantage. And often it's based on which areas of what type you control. Uh -huh. So that's really pretty cool. It's a great mechanic. And I felt like I wanted the areas to have a bit more personality. So I introduced worker and soldier and military districts. So of the districts on the board, there are 16 right now, there's four worker and four military. So of course now the part then saying place cubes in worker districts, place cubes in military districts and Hang on a sec, you're breaking, things like that. You're breaking up a little bit there. So if you just repeat that last bit for me about the, the worker and the military. So by adding, by taking a cue from Europe in turmoil, I now have worker and military districts on the board not that many but the idea being events key off of it and depending on which party is dominant in Duma, you're able to create special kinds of organizations in those districts so for example a special organization in the workers district would be a union for the government and having a union is an extra benefit but you'd have to have the monarchy party bulked up to a certain point. So now you have an interplay between which political parties are, are dominant in the Duma and what kinds of organizations you can create in the districts on the board. So that creates another level of um, of interaction between the, the Duma and the board. So, so far, this Duma mechanic is working really well. Okay. Players, what you wind up it is typically the revolutionary wants to spread their control out across the board. But if they completely ignore the Duma, the government's going to dominate and gets all kinds of points out of there. Whereas if the government says, no, I'm going to the streets, I'm going to put a lot of cubes into the this, this urban districts, they lose control of the government. They lose control of the Duma itself. So you really have to balance your play saying, how much do I, time do I spend on political wrangling and trying to get control of my party? Versus going out in the streets, the equivalent of placing a cube in an urban district is mm -hmm. like standing on the street with a pamphlet or having right. a rally or right. organizing a meeting. So Interesting. that's the that's the choices that you're confronted with. Interesting. And and so when you and that's di that's different from the prior title as well. So it, it had no parliamentary impact really, if I recall, from from a little bit. Of, a little bit, right? It, it had a set of it had a set of um, districts, like a set of tracks, which were called the uh, uh, what well, I forget what they're called, but it was essentially represent the uh, the uh, colonial government cities. Got it. And there were some special events associated with it, but not to the degree. This is a full kind of crank turn of the crank uh -huh. on developing uh -huh. uh, that idea. Okay. Um, so as, as we've got as we've gone through this conversation, we've talked about uh, ideation and design and mechanics and some of the art uh, concepts and things of that nature. How are you from a from a delivery standpoint? I know Compass is going to print and produce and all the rest of it. Will will you be trying to get out to some game conventions to share it with more folks? Are you, how are you going to does Compass do all the marketing, or will you get involved with that? Do they? 
ask you to do that as well. Yeah. So I am contractually obligated to write an article for Paper Wars and do one interview with John Kranz. Okay. But I think you know me well enough to know that I'm hard to shut up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm on Facebook and yeah. Board Game yeah. Geek yeah. and every place else yeah. I can manage. Yeah. I really love promoting gaming. I love promoting this right. game. It's a lot of fun. Right. So what I expect to do is um, my first target is maybe uh, I have to show up at GMT East in March or so if unless they object to it. I have to check with whoever runs that, bring a prototype, set it up and play. Mm -hmm. If I can make it out, to, um, John Krantz told me that they're planning a sort of a, a, either a version of Consum World or something like that in Texas. That's right. Sometime early next year. Yeah. And if that's the case, I might um, do my best to get out there. I would like to get to Consum World and I'll definitely be at the Consum World, the, the, sorry, the Compass Game Expo again here in November next year. I'm my sort of grand plan, or for, for lack of a better term, is to hit those conventions, get as much kind of input feedback as I can, bring something that's pretty close to final to that those June conventions, maybe Compton World or mm -hmm. Texas, whichever it is, and then by next November be showing production finals. Right, and would it be a possible. release for late uh, sort of uh, Q3 next year? It's really, I, I would like to, one of the driving factors is uh, the time it takes to produce. Right. If I had a finished copy of the game now and I was ready to send it off for production, it would be six or seven months away just because right. card, mounted maps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It takes time. Yeah. And it, you know, Compass doesn't do a pre-order per se. They kind of, uh, they, they take pre-orders, but I don't, they don't do a minimum do they have a minimum cutoff, or is that all kept internal? I don't know. I, I've I've seen as you have that they do accept pre-orders, and that's for a discounted version of the game, yeah. um, or discounted price on the game. I don't know about um, whether they do a GMT like P five hundred thing. Yeah, I don't think I've so. I've always been curious about that because they always seem to um, their price, you know, price per value with Compass. I've always found them to be a little more expensive, which I'm assuming that. It's a lower print run. Just that's you know for the half of the course, right? If mm -hmm. if the if you put two hex encounter games side by side and they both had equivalent rules and mm -hmm. maps and counters, typically you see the compass is a little more expensive, but mm -hmm. if not substantially more, depending on what the title is. But right. But uh, I, and I think that's a function of the print run, right? Because I think GMT obviously now has the scale where they say, hey, look, yeah. you know, any game we do, we're printing 1,500 or 2,000 or 750 or whatever it ends up being, there's, it's, it's probably more than 1,000 these days. But Compass seems to uh, do, and I love the fact that they'll just say, hey, we're printing this game and they're not waiting for, because it's not really a P500 with GMT. It's really 750, and then it better be a thousand, yeah. right? So, right, uh, right. Right, so, so I love the fact that Compass will actually get stuff out into the marketplace you know, on a faster time frame, generally speaking, than perhaps um, yep. uh, other other publishers will will do. Uh, are you going to have? You know, one was one of the questions I will probably get from folks when I publish this, you know, chat. Uh, you know, well, is there anyone who's developing other than you as the designer? Is there some someone looking over the shoulder going, oh, hang on, guys. I mean, you know, this is not right or that art's not right or these rules need to be tweaked. That That's kind of a, there are some concerns sometimes with some games. You know, our, our buddy Adam has occasionally had some time yep. that have had some challenges yep. for lack of development or developer yep. per se, right? Uh, whether they were printing snafus or whatever the case may be. So, that going to happen? So, I'm yeah, that's going to happen. Good. Uh, I'm extremely fortunate that one of the first Skype calls I made was to Marco Poutre, who's the designer of the right. Prelude system and game. Good. And as soon as he heard about this, he said, well, I'll develop it for you. Oh, perfect. So, my right. developer is the designer the of the designer, base system. designer, right, the core designer. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. So, now... Which is great because I had, you know, uh, in my professional life, I distinguish between bright ideas and good ideas. Mm -hmm. And bright ideas typically sound like good ideas, but they're really not. So I've had quite a few bright ideas of my own so far. 
And But I always bounce anything that I feel is going to be an innovation in the system or tinkering or adding a layer or adding a chrome, mm -hmm. I bounce it off Marco and say, what do you think? And he's, he's the one who's provided very solid advice. And um, for example, I had a much more elaborate version of the Duma at some point. And he said, this is great, but it's a game by itself. It kind of overshadows, takes over the game. There's no reason to play anywhere else. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. Back it off. Uh, there were some questions about, well, should this or that happen when this third event takes place? All the stuff us gamers always come up with. But being able to refer to Marco and have it come back in the context of the fundamental principles of the design and having that be the guiding uh, uh, driver has been extremely useful. So, yeah, Marco's developed the game. Uh, he's lined up uh, some, he's got an artist and a vessel module producer who are waiting in the wings for us to get done enough to go into that cycle. Because as you probably realize, doing a vessel module, suddenly you're now in IT change control mode, yes. as well as everything else, yes. which is desperately to be avoided. Yes. Um, so we won't go there until we're really sure we're pretty stable. But those people are ready. Uh, so yeah, that I'm pretty confident that, um, and and I have the commitment. And I made this commitment to Bill and Ken at Compass that they would like to do. They would like to do a series of Prelude games, and I think it's a great idea. It's mm -hmm. a system that will flex well and will grow. I think like Coin has grown, at least hopefully not get too far down the line. Like my opinion, at least Coin is gone, but that's right. probably a different discussion. Yeah, but. Um, they're already thinking series here. So I said, look, when we make decisions here in Re Revolution, we have to look back to Rebellion and say, okay, but is this consistent with the design? Are we setting a precedent here that's so different that the next right. game is going to go off on a tangent? So we're right. keeping pretty true to the design principles. That's fantastic. That's a, it, sounds, it sounds like uh, a system that will have some legs. I can imagine there's a number of topics that this would play well to. Given that it's not, it's not, uh, and this is nothing against coin, but you know, the whole concept of coin was supposed to be asymmetrical conflicts. Yep. And while some are asymmetrical conflicts, there are many who aren't. It's it's just a good system for a four player CDG in, right. in the vein of coin. And yep. uh, I think some some folks who are diehards around words uh, get spun up around the axle on that. I've got a couple of buddies here in Austin who are like, well, that's not, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's not asymmetrical work warfare. And I said, well, of course it's not, but it's, that's really, it's not about that. It's about the system enabling us to have some experience or exposure right. like with Gandhi, right? You could yep. say that's asymmetrical, but it's nothing to do with warfare. It, it's a very diplomatic engage, set of engagements that, that tend to happen in that game versus, yeah. um, you know, Gandhi's not. Uh, well, think, army, right? think about the think about the syndicate faction in Cuba Libre. Right, right. I don't care what you guys do as long as I can open my casinos right. and make my money. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Completely yeah, asymmetrical yeah, yeah, to yeah, everything yeah. that's going yeah, on. Exactly. It's it's uh, it, it that you asked the question before, which is interesting because you said what about multiplayer? So, if I can just harken back, so Dave Doctor, the the brilliant designer of uh, Triumph of Chaos, by the way, which is inspired by Paths of Glory, he will tell you if you've read anything he's written about it. So they, there's, there's this inspirational cycle going on. Um, I asked him, "Wouldn't you know what about multiplayer for your game?" And he said, "Yeah, but what would you know? What would one of the players do? Like you know, you're talking about." Poland could be a third player in that game, but Poland really doesn't do much until the game's about a third of the way over. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, Coin handles that in Liberty or Death pretty well with the French player, if you played that game, where the French player doesn't have pieces on the board, really, but they're financing. Their fleet is yes. kind of impeding the British, and they're financing the, the rebels or the patriots or whatever you want to call them. Um, similarly, in I, I thought maybe... So multiplayer Russian Civil War is questionable. The multiplayer in this game, in Prelude uh, to Rebellion, to Revolution, might be each player plays one of the 
parties. Part of what, like, right, right. You know, you're Bolshevik, socialist, if you're on one side, or you're a, so it would be like the coin, you're an insurgent or you're not. Right. And then you got two of each. So this would be your revolutionary of the government. Monica's and you're either so. the, yeah, exactly. I just think that, um, you know, the, 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 guiding principle that I have got an, an engine and a frame and a suspension and a drivetrain and everything that works really well. Now I'm putting a different body on it and maybe it's going to be a pickup truck instead of a sedan. And maybe it's going to be, you know, seat six instead of four and it's going to be red instead of blue um, and more changes. But I want to keep that underlying structure, that engine of the game intact. Yeah. And if it works, it works, I think it right? really works. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm... I'm a little frustrated to a certain extent with folks saying you know, they're coming out with a new game. It's like, yeah, it's two player and it's four player and it's co-op and it's solo and it's got an AI and it's got the <laughs> it's got the kitchen sink and your mom's gonna make cookies in the morning and it's gonna it's gonna do everything for everybody and it's all awesome. I uh, no, it's not. And especially when no. you hear some of these Kickstarters that come out with a, a they run out of expansions and they go, ah, okay, it's got co-op. <laughs> oh, okay. Now let's go co-op. Someone better go write some rules. I, I think it's uh, also, to your point, it's it's adding something to market, and I, I think it's responding to trends. Yeah. I believe successful designs, the ones I've seen that are successful, the designer has got some very strong principles and vision of where this thing has to go, what the player should experience, what it should feel like to play. At least that's my, my gut. Um, some players, you know, just to, as an analogy, I used to play a lot of 40K miniatures. Huh. And I love painting the models, and I love my orcs and my crazy vehicles and such. I do not see you as a 40K minis guy. That is oh, oh, I did yeah. not know about that about you, Mike. There's a story. Orcs and Necrons, baby. Ah, orcs and Necrons. Damn. But um, I, see, for me, the fun of it is the cool models. I really don't care if I win or lose the game i kind of like winning better than losing but not at the expense of fun but as long as my crazy homemade orc stampa which is basically an, an inverted yogurt container covered with plastic bits and painted red as long as that thing can make it on the board i'm good, good. as opposed to these guys we met they play regularly at a local game store where the guy told me he came to the club and what a player but he said you know i don't care for their bottle caps or pawn, you know pawns from a chess set i just want to like play they don't really care about the feel, the fluff, the models, right. or these different gamers play differently. Yeah. So similarly, you know, you got to accommodate them, but ultimately, you got to be true to yourself and say, "I'm playing for a gamer who's not going to throw the toys out of the pram when some event occurs, which completely derails their plans, takes and and forces them to prioritize right. World War One over their political maneuverings." Right. 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 And, and if you're the player who's like wants it to be a well-calculated path to victory that you just sort of tick the trigger and watch it go, then don't play Triumph for Chaos, don't play Twilight Struggle, don't play Europe in Turmoil, and don't play Rebellion, <laughs> the, the prelude system, because it does take it does confront you with these competing priorities. You've got to be able to deal with it. So, so the, the design philosophy is interesting that in, in how you who you're trying to make happy. And, and 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 if they are going to throw, as you say, throw the toys out of the pram, right, or throw the baby out with the bathwater, <laughs> then this is not their game, right? Uh, and I, and I, 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 I often, I, I would encourage other designers to have that philosophy as well, and not just not try and do everything for everybody, because I think it diminishes it diminishes the game, and it takes away from the core value of it, and. Uh, and I don't think that's valuable to, to us when we buy it. Yeah, you know, give give the player who likes to min-max their way through certain to certain victories something else to try right. that they'll enjoy rather than try and tailor everything to everybody. I think that's exactly right. And right. Uh, it's 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 more fun that way. And at least I'm having fun designing it. Yeah, well, it's an interesting evolution for you, I imagine. You know, being a long-term gamer as, as you have been and... <laughs> Right. Well, it, it takes a village to, to quote, yeah. um, if it was just me doing this, there's no way. Yeah. If it wasn't Marco and the, the great play testers and play and design partners who've been pitching in, it wouldn't, wouldn't be progressing. Um, 
but it is a lot of work. It's on me. You know, when I come back from a playtest session, I'm kind of responsible for jotting down, right. well, what did I learn? What do I, how does it change the game? Making the changes to the game, et cetera. And now I fully understand as much as these stray words and unexplained references and vestiges we see in our rules and we as players go, what are you doing? Why, did, why are you still calling it A when it's B? Right. Well, now I see how that happens yeah. because over the time you're just dealing with trying to keep control of rules, cards, boards, play aids, and all this other stuff. And it, it can be challenging. Well, I wish you the best of luck with this. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with it. And, uh, you know, Thank if, you, if it comes Q3 next year, that'd be great. If it's earlier, even better. I'd uh, be happy to, uh, if you, you get to the point where you've got some artwork that we can share or some images, oh, even no. some drop stuff, let's get them up on the blog and share it out so we get a little more awareness going and sure. build some momentum up for you. I'd love to try and help out however I can. Sure. Thanks. Um, I'm, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we've, like I said, uh, I'm thinking that it's going to be Q4 next year if, okay. if things proceed at pace. Right. This, that would be my desire, first of all, to get it over with. So, <laughs> sure, it could, be a, it could be in the Christmas stocking for 2020, right? There you go. That's right. Nothing like a little bit of anarchy for, in your yeah, Christmas yeah, stocking. You Perfect. <laughs> well, I wish you the best with it. And uh, let's stay in touch over the next few few months as things evolve and Maybe we can uh, chat again, or uh, sure. you happy to if you want to write uh, something for the blog, we'd be happy to. You know, I should wait. I would be happy. To. The entire organization, yeah, so will the, be. Uh, uh, the big board and incorporated, would uh, be happy to have your contribution. Uh, we'd love to do that. Be awesome. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's it's great to chat again. I hope you're going to find your way up to New York so we can get you down to the club and maybe play a bit this yeah, time. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to do something like that. It's it's. Uh, my my last few trips up there have just been so quick that uh, it's it's not mm. been um it hasn't been the time to really sort of you know pop the cork and relax a little bit so yeah I know how you feel I, we had uh, Walter Ve Vejdovic I'm sorry I'm not sure yeah. how we pronounce the it hexasim? from the, 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 yeah. yeah yeah. Go does the Napoleonic Hexasim game he's he visited a couple of times we had him down at the club I got to play Lingy with him. And uh, he, I had to just basically miss one of his visits myself because of work. It's just, and I'm here. Right, I right. couldn't get away from, yeah. uh, get away from the salt mine too. Yeah.